Professor Thompson and the IW Wind Ensemble. Thanks for that beautiful number. It is a delight to welcome. Hi, welcome uh, IWU to this a wonderful occasion today. And I'd like to welcome especially special guests who are here. Mr. Nell Reed, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lyle Reed and Nell for your uh, involvement in this uh, event. Thank you so much for making it possible. And uh, uh, Mayor, great to have you here with us here uh, today as well. And for all of you that are with us, uh, Ida View faculty and staff, thank you so much for here, for being here. The public recognition and celebration of world changers has become part of Indiana Western University's experience and life together. This morning, in our 18th year to conduct this invocation, we honor Mr. Pat Gelsinger, one of our world's most visible Christian leaders and a follower of Jesus Christ, who is using his platform to change the world. As this convocation unfolds, you'll better learn why Mr. Gelsinger embodies the essence 
of what we have come to call a world changer here at Indiana Wesleyan. So most importantly, I just would like to honor and welcome the Lord Jesus Christ into our presence. We honor Pat today, but we honor God for raising up Pat and giving him the platform and the will and desire to honor Jesus in all he does. We'll be led in our invocation today by Landon Brown, who is a senior majoring in visual communication design from Greenville, Ohio. He was part of the inaugural football team, the first 50 here at, at uh, Indiana Wesleyan University. By the way, that, that team is seven and one in their third year, right? Give them a hand. <laughs> And even better than that, they're honoring God in the way they play and conduct themselves in our midst. He's also a part of John Wesley Honors College. Landon serves as your elected student body president, along with an amazing group of you students who serve together in Student Government Association. Landon, come and lead us in the invocation. Okay. Would you all bow your heads with me as we go into a time of prayer? Thank you, Lord, so, so much for everybody in this room. Thank you for bringing all these people here. Um, as a school, as we enter into a hard time of the year and just prepping for finals and everything like that and getting to that point where everything gets tough, just give a sense of peace over every single student in this room and faculty as well. Um, thank you for bringing Pat here with us today as our world changer inductee. Um, thank you for blessing him with the gifts and the talents to show your glory throughout the world in every single thing that he does and just Bless him today as he speaks and as we induct him into this amazing group of people. Thank you so much once again for every single person here and help everybody have an amazing day today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. You all look great, especially without masks on. Hey, how about that? <laughs> I should say for your visitors and for Pat, we've had several weeks where we had no student uh, cases of COVID on campus, and so we're just so pleased with the way God has helped us to move forward. Well, I'm often asked, why do we have a Society of World Changers at Indiana Wesleyan University, and what are the criteria for being selected for this honor? And to that end, we've created a video that helps to describe this award and why we give it and how we select those who receive it. So watch this video. From then on, I decided I, I wanted to live my life for the Lord and use the platform that I had to honor Him. Because if we all wake up in the morning with the intent of making one person's world better, and we're all world changers. You and I have been called to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Speak up for the rights of all who are weak and needy. Our greatness is not in success, but in service. And the beautiful thing is, you friends don't have to break your neck to serve and become a world changer. Each year, the Society of World Changers Committee meets to select the next inductee to the Society of World Changers. There are among eight committee members, the SGA president, university president, dean of the chapel, faculty chair, vice president for university advancement, a representative from the board of trustees, and finally, senior counsel to the president. Each committee member has the opportunity to nominate potential candidates who meet the guidelines for the award and is asked to seek input from their peers. Once the committee selects and prioritizes their choice of candidates, the candidates are contacted and asked to accept the award and come to campus for our convocation. In order for a person to qualify for consideration as a member of the Society of World Changers, they must meet the following three criteria. They must be a faithful Christian by example, reputation, and influence. They must be known as a Christian who models Christ-likeness and uses their professional platform to impact their world and culture for Christ. And finally, they must be an individual who has risen to national prominence. Just as these individuals have impacted their world for Christ, God has called each of us to change our own worlds.
It was a good mutual friend who introduced me to Mr. Gelsinger. Mac McQuiston is an alumnus from Indiana Wesleyan University. Some of you may know Mac. He's a great friend of ours. And he began to tell me about this gentleman that I needed to get to know because of the quality of his work as a professional in the public realm, but even more so because of his deep commitment to honoring Jesus and all that he does. So on behalf of Indiana Wesleyan University, it is my great privilege to introduce Mr. Pat Gelsinger as the 19th individual inducted into the Society of World Changers. The men and women identified as IW World Changers have left an indelible mark on our society and on our Christian heritage. Early in life, Mr. Gelsinger developed a deep and powerful work ethic as he worked on a farm with his dad and extended family members. In his junior year of high school, Pat says that he accidentally, that's probably a good story there, uh, took the Lincoln Technical Institute's Electronic Technology Scholarship Exam, a test that was intended for seniors. And he won the scholarship, which provided two years of free tuition into Lincoln Technical Institute. So Mr. Gelsinger finished his high school program a year early by taking community college courses and doing other things to complete his high school requirements, even while he was holding down a part-time job. Lincoln Tech was Pat's first experience with computers. He later commented about his love for computers. The idea that I could tell a machine to do something and it would do it, he said, was like, wow, how do, what a wonderful thing to do. Some of you identify with that, right? And others of you are scratching your heads, but you're going to hear more about it in a minute. In his last semester at Lincoln, Mr. Gelsinger began interviewing for electronics technicians positions. Intel came east from California and interviewed him. His first airplane ride was at the age of 18 on a flight to California to interview there at Intel. Mr. Gelsinger graduated from his high school class in June of 1979 and then finished an associate's degree from Lincoln Tech at the top of his class in August of that year and left for California in October to start working at Intel. While at Intel, he began attending Santa Clara Christian Church, and it was there where he encountered the life-changing message of the gospel and also met his future wife, Linda. Like any well-trained engineer, Pat recognized the need for a good blueprint. But this time it wasn't for a project he was working on, but for his own life. So he put pen to paper and purposely wrote a personal mission statement to help guide his life and define a vision of what kind of man he wanted to be, including scripture references to ensure his value statements lined up with scripture. He set goals and prioritized priorities and lives by them today. While at Intel, Mr. Gelsinger earned his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, graduating magna cum laude from Santa Clara University, and a master's degree in electrical engineering and computer science from Stanford University. Pat's career at Intel took off. He began working on highly visible things that every one of us uses, USB and Wi-Fi. Love to hear how that came about. Uh, and why did you make the thing the way it works? It's like, anyway. Uh. <laughs> he was also the architect, and some of you may know this, of the original 8486 processor. This success led to Pat becoming the company's first ever chief technology officer. He holds eight tech industry design patents developed for communication, computer architecture, and VLSI design. In 2009, he left Intel to become the President and Chief Operating Officer of EMC, and in 2012, he became CEO of VMware, where he served for eight years. Earlier this year, he was invited back to the company where he started his career, Intel, as their CEO. Now, there's one more thing you really need to know about Pat, and I'm sure he'd want me to share this. He may talk about it himself. In 2013, he co-founded Transforming the Bay for Christ, a coalition of business leaders, venture capitalists, nonprofit leaders, and pastors aiming to convert one million people over the decade. He helped establish the Sacramento area, 
William Jessup Christian University and was identified in Money, Inc. magazine in 2018 as among the most generous billionaires in the world. He is a purposeful leader who believes he's been called to ministry within the workplace. In an interview in, with Google in 2015, he said, the job that I'm given, the position that I hold, is meant to be a platform to be a workplace minister. I can't wait for you to meet and hear from our inductee today, Mr. Pat Gelsinger. Come and share with us, Pat. Well, it's such an honor to be here, and I'm so grateful for the award, the uh, recognition, but to God be the only reward and recognition that's due man. So thank you for this opportunity. And as I come here today, you know, a few, a little bit more of my story and a little bit more of the mission uh, that I'm on today. And as I like to say, I've had the uh, Cinderella career. And, uh, you know, literally my parents were both uh, one-room schoolhouse educated, first through eighth grade, and, uh, you know, never any uh, education beyond the uh, eighth grade. And as we were growing up, they'd say, go to school, get your PhD. They didn't even know what a PhD was. But they had this deep sense that we had to pursue and gain an education. And uh, in fact, my parents uh, live in that one room schoolhouse. It became their residence. And my dad said, if I ever left the house, I'd have no brains at all, right? Since that's where he got all of his formal education there and uh, uh, in that uh, home. And uh, sadly, my father just passed away uh, September 4th of this year and still in that same bedroom that I grew up in and still able to honor his uh, great legacy. So as uh, noted in the introduction, I accidentally took a scholarship exam, uh, 18 years old, moved to California. Before I went to my interview, I promised my mom that I would not move to California. They're crazy out there, right? You know, they got cults and earthquakes, we're gonna fall in the ocean, right? You know, but it was my first plane trip. You know, of course I'm gonna go to California. Well, that began an incredible uh, journey and uh, becoming an engineer at uh, Intel was like my life's greatest dream uh, at the time. You know, an engineer at Intel, wow. And uh, became, uh, you know, went finished my bachelor's and master's while working full time. My wife and I joke that we squeezed a year worth of dating into three years because I was working full-time, going to school full-time, and had this deep sense. Uh, we accidentally started our family, not in the bad way. I was on a 10-year journey to finish my bachelor's, master's, PhD, and uh, uh, postdoc work. Uh, Linda comes to me, and she had endometriosis, and the doctor said, kids, now or never. I was on the 10-year plan, and God had a very different plan. And uh, so we got married, she got pregnant, and uh, now we have four children and eight grandchildren. And uh, for all of you who are thinking about marriage, just skip kids, go straight to grandkids. <laughs> yeah, it's much better. Kids are great, you know, my wife hates it when I tell that uh, as well. But it's been a Cinderella career. Uh, at uh, 24 years old, I resigned from Intel, uh, and uh, the legendary leader of Silicon Valley, Andy Grove. I'm resigning, going finish, to finish my PhD at Stanford. And uh, Andy comes to me and he says, you can go there and learn in the simulator or you can stay here and fly the jet. And I became the design manager of the 8486 at 24 years old. Nobody on the design team was younger than me. And I'm in charge of the design team at the time. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? Right? I never did finish that earned PhD, so thank you for the assistance you know, today. <laughs> My mom will be very happy to know that I'm a doctor, but she'll look at me and she'll say, I still think you need to earn the PhD someday. You know, I'm still not quite made it uh, in her mind yet. Uh, became the first ever CTO uh, for uh, Intel, USB, Wi-Fi, personal computers, many other key industry standards. It truly has become a Cinderella career. And uh, when I left uh, Intel, uh, before, it was, I, I call it my 11-year vacation, right? I uh, was pushed out of the company and uh, went to EMC as president, uh, VMware as the uh, CEO for eight years, and now back for eight months. But we'll come back to that uh, story in a moment. 
but the opportunity to use the platform that God gives you for God-given purposes is one of the great blessings that you will have as a business Christian leader, as a Christian leader, as a business person, as a community person, as a teacher. How will you use the platform that God has given you for his purposes? And one of the brief stories, and I had breakfast with some of the students this morning that I was referencing on this, was uh, Linda and I attended a seminar, a young marriage seminar, early in our marriage, and uh, the speaker challenged us at the time to give an increasing percentage of our gross income to charitable work each year. Linda and I became convicted to do that. Uh, we began at 10%, you know, a good biblical tie, that's, the, that's where you should start, right? And then it became 11, 12, and here we are 40 years later, 50% of our gross income being given to charitable work each year. And the 10% was a little bit of nothing, and the 50% is a whole lot of a lot. And over that uh, journey, we've been able to passionately participate in many philanthropies that truly are changing the life of our nation. We helped to start Stadia, which is today the largest church planting organization in America today. Uh, we'll plant about 1,500 new churches this year. 1,500 new places of worship. We uh, have been deeply involved in the Luis Palau Association. I know some of you know the Green family. We've partnered with them to help to start a movement of city gospel movements, of which TBC is one of them, which I'll talk about in a moment. We also have invested in Missions of Hope International. When we first started working with them, they were 200 kids in the slums of Kenya. Today, my wife is on the board of them, and we have 25,000 kids now receiving six, uh, six days of education, two meals a day, spiritual training uh, now, and we have a vision of 100,000 kids going to those schools uh, every day of every year, lifting the slums of Kenya into modern cities. And I'll tell you, if you wanna talk about life changing, go to a slum and see them now in school. One of their graduates is now graduating from Stanford this year as a business major from the slums to the highest institutions in the world. That is life changing. And this idea of TBC, transforming the Bay with Christ, as I briefly describe it, the Bay Area has four characteristics. One is it's the richest place on planet Earth. It's arguably the most influential place on planet Earth. It is the least ministered place on planet Earth. It has the lowest population on the census of, you know, or the highest population of saying no religious affiliation at all. And one of the lowest philanthropic rates in the nation. So my ministry field is rich, influential, miserly pagans. That's who I'm called to serve, ain't that great? And what we've done with TBC is to unify, amplify, and multiply the work of the church in the Bay Area. And these are some of the examples from my life and career. And it began with a simple challenge years ago, invest more every year to the work of Christ. And for that, I challenge each one of you to take a similar pledge, a similar challenge as you move on from Indiana Wesley and move into the marketplace, into the workplace. How will you use your platform of influence in a dramatic and influential way? How will you be a world changer? Because that is what God has called each one of us to be, a world changer. You know, my life verse, Colossians 3, 23 and 24, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. I am thrilled to get a salary and thrilled from uh, Intel, thrilled to work for the board of directors, but ultimately, who's my CEO? His name is Jesus Christ. And that's the same CEO that calls each one of you to be a world changer. 11 years ago, I was pushed out of Intel. It was a devastating moment. It's what I call a death of a vision. 
I had written my mission statement that I would become the CEO of Intel, and I had written that when I was in my 20s. It was an audacious goal when I wrote it. You know, I had no hope of ever doing that. You know, I'm a stupid farm kid from Pennsylvania. How would I ever aspire to be the CEO of one of the iconic, you know, Fortune 50 firms of the nation, right? Isn't that just crazy? But I had that vision. And then somewhat like Joseph or Moses, when I was pushed out of the company 11 years ago, my vision died. Many of you will go through those deaths of a vision in your life and career, where the thing that I thought God was calling me to is no longer there, no longer possible. And the first couple of years after leaving Intel in the role were painful. I used to go to bed at night and I'd do the Intel bong, but do, 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 right? You know, before going to sleep, you know, it was just so ingrained into your blood, your, you know, every portion. You know, I had grown up there. I started there so young. I went through puberty at Intel, right? You know, just, right? You know, this, was, this was my home. This was my place. These were my people. And to leave it was devastating. And when I was called back to be the CEO, of Intel in February of this year. You know, my wife and I ruined our Christmas holidays as we were agonizing on whether we were gonna go back. We were just having our eighth grandchild, life is good. You know, I'm a very successful CEO. I had tripled the market cap of VMware, you know, and having, you know, lots of spare time to do these philanthropic efforts. You know, why should I go turn around an iconic company, do it in the middle of a pandemic, and in the middle of a global semiconductor crisis? What do you think? That's an easy job. 115,000 people, 10 years of bad decisions that are made. You know, this dramatic role that technology plays in every aspect. The world is going more digital. Everything digital runs on semiconductors. And after a month of agonizing, Linda and I decided to take the job. And obviously, it's been a dramatic eight months since then. Everything in our life has gone topsy-turvy. You know, Intel believes that we have the opportunity to improve the life of every human on the planet. And how many of you have used one of our technologies? Have you ever used USB? Okay, uh, ever used Wi-Fi? Ever used a personal computer? We truly are a company that can change the life of every human on the planet. Not change it, improve the life of every human on the planet. And the world changer mission that I have for this phase of my journey is that we would be shaping, and from this massive platform that I have at Intel, that we would be shaping technology as a force for good. And if you think about technology, is it good or bad? Good or bad, what do you think? She's not sure, and that's right because technology itself is neutral. Was the printing press that Gutenberg produced in uh, 1486, was it good or bad? It could be printing good or printing bad. It's our job to be shaping it as a force for good. And some of our technologies today, incredibly good. You know, the fact that we could have the greatest migration in human history and still keep productive economy working because of technology, pretty good. mRNA, you know, the fastest, most tested vaccine in his, human history. Pretty good, don't you think? And yet we look at some of our social systems today, bringing out the worst of humanity, pretty bad. We need to be shaping technology as a force for good. So in addition to our philanthropic endeavors, in addition to the opportunity to stand in front of Fortune 500 CEOs and declare that I am proudly a disciple of Jesus Christ, I also have the opportunity to shape technology through my platform as the Intel CEO as a force for good for all of humanity. Thank you so much for letting me join you today. Well, thank you so much, Pat, for those stirring remarks. It's not often that we get to sit and listen to someone with Pat's platform. But I will tell you that every day, all of you interact with people who have every bit of the ability that Pat has to honor God with our lives. And it's the decisions we make every day 
when we come onto this campus at Indiana Western University, whether you're the president or a faculty member or an administrator or you students, it's the decisions we make every day that point to what we're going to become someday. So Pat, thanks for the example you've given us of someone who made choices all along the way and that God is honored with a platform to work for good. You inspired us. Well, it's just us, right? It's just family. Can I kind of not be too formal and uh, do something I wouldn't ever normally do in a formal time? But uh, uh, is Brandon Charlton here? I, I shouldn't put him on the spot. Is Brandon here? Brandon, are you here? Uh, I don't know if he's here. <laughs> you all know Brandon? I, I just want to honor Jesus in Brandon because Brandon's making choices every day to honor God with his life. And someday God is going to put Brandon in a place to be a world changer. Um, you may hate me for this, but hey, Ben, would you stand up a minute? Yep, Ben, that's you. Yep. <laughs> I just want to honor Ben. Yeah, go ahead. Give him a give him, give him applause. Ben's making choices that win us football games. <laughs> but more than that, he's making choices about what kind of man Ben's going to be. Thank you for doing that, Ben. And these are just a couple guys I know. I know their names. I know them. I could call out others of you who are names. And you're making choices every day. Because, you know, you may think I'll never be the president of Intel or anything like that. But you know what? You don't know where God's going to take you, do you? Everybody who knew me when I was a kid would have never guessed I would be president of a university. No way. God has a way of doing things we don't expect, but only if we make the choices every day to walk with him faithfully. Amen? You with me on that? Well, now we get to do a couple of fun things. Now that I've wasted a bunch of our time, <laughs> Lynn is worried about the time, I'm sure. By the way, would you give a hand to Lynn Monday uh, for all the phenomenal work she did to plan this today? So now we get to unveil these busts that you all walk by over there in the rotunda. So Pat, would you come and join us right here? We're going to let you see this bus for the first time, and, and we're going to unveil so without a doubt, Mr. Gelsinger's life is an inspiration and a reminder to all of us that initiative, vision, dedication, being true to yourself in Christ are the essential ingredients to a fruitful life. Can you tell something good is about to happen? Here we go, the corral. This is my father's world.
Mr. Davy Chen and the IW Corral, aren't they great? And thank you, you guys, for playing for us today. And thanks to the marching band for what you guys are doing uh, on Saturdays. What a wonderful, uh, fun time that is. Thank you for starting that tradition of playing the doxology at the end of our football games. Isn't that a cool thing? I I'm pretty certain there's no other collegiate football team in, in America on Saturday afternoon that ends their games with the doxology. But uh, ours, ours are doing that. So all of you that do that out of the music division, thank you so much. Well, you've heard the remarkable story of one of God's servants who has pursued him in every aspect of his life. So, Pat, would you come forward as we honor you today with an honorary doctorate degree? Today, it's my privilege to honor you, Mr. Pat Gelsinger, for being a visible Christian business leader focused on ministering in your workplace, for leading with heart and leveraging your resources to support your community and the globe, for your powerful witness for Jesus Christ in every aspect of your life. We thank you and honor you. And for your exemplary personal life, which has modeled what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Now by the authority vested in me by the Indiana Western University Board of Trustees and the State of Indiana, I confer upon you the degree Doctor of Science, in token of which I cause you to be vested with the appropriate academic hood and present you this parchment of documentation. Congratulations. Remain standing now for the, the benediction, if you would. Professor Andre Payne will offer our benediction. Andre is Assistant Professor of Marketing for the DeVoe Division of Business, and prior to becoming full-time faculty at Indiana Western University, he served as the director of the Taylor Fund at our wonderful colleague and friends and great competitors, Taylor University, <laughs> where he received his bachelor's degree. Andre completed an MBA from the Keller Graduate School of Management and is currently in his final year of doctoral studies where he's pursuing his PhD in organizational leadership right here at Indiana Western University. Following the benediction, I would ask that we would please be seated during the recessional. Andre. Shall we pray? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for Pat Gelsinger's commitment to being one of the most visible Christian leaders of the 21st century and the 2021 Society World Changer inductee. Although he has won countless business awards over the years, it's past commitment to your kingdom that we are most grateful for. He, along with his wife Linda, have dedicated their lives to evangelism by way of offering their talents, their time, and their treasure to countless churches and nonprofit organizations to help improve the lives of people in need. 
and for that, we are so thankful. Lord, may they continue to play an active role in spreading the gospel by working with organizations that help plant churches throughout the United States and South America. We pray that Pat's creativity and ingenuity in the business world continues to be supported. We pray that his dedication to family continues to be highlighted as an example for us all. And we pray his willingness to be a vessel that kingdom blessings flow through continues to be recognized as world changing. Now by the grace of God, the love of Jesus and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest rule and abide now, henceforth and forevermore. Let us all say,